All right, we need to start this next uh, segment, uh, and it's going to be a really exciting panel between uh, Dr. Arnie, our beloved Dr. Arnie Goldman, and uh, Patty Strand, who's going to continue talking about uh, an update on the retail rescue and the importation issues. So we're going to continue the topic we were talking about before the break. I want to say that uh, both Dr. K. Carter Corker and Gleason Murphy just did a, a fabulous job. And one of the big... <laughs> and, and one of the really big problems for us has been not really recognizing during all the years that we've worked on this, the limited statutory authority that the agencies have to do the kinds of things that we would want them to do. So they have done pretty much everything they can within the law and within the budgets that, and resources that they have. Uh, but we're going to have a, a, we're going to talk about this a little bit more. We're going to talk about how severe we think this issue is in terms of an animal welfare issue, and what it's doing to destroy the dog marketplace. Um, we're going to talk about that a little bit more. Um, Dr. Goldman's going to talk about what he sees in his practice in terms of the disease issues that are being fomented as a result of the lack of current regulation on this. I'm going to talk a little bit about the displacement of locally bred dogs and purebred dogs, uh, which speaks then to the degrading of the overall dog marketplace. Um, and then I'm going to talk about some suggestions that we have that we're going to invite your participation in to um, help us to, to work on getting some new laws passed at both the state level and the federal level. So this thing that we're talking about, those of us who've been involved with it for a while, we call it retail rescue, and it is a combination. Well, if you think it's a good thing, if you are a rescue group or if you are somebody who sympathizes with uh, this new kind of rescue, you would call it humane relocation. If you notice that some of these dogs are being transported across international boundaries with rabies, with falsified papers, and with um, and, and being placed in a way that endangers public health and safety, you might say this is dog trafficking. So the umbrella term for uh, what we've landed on, and this is one we really recommend everybody use when they talk about this, to distinguish it from the kinds of rescue that we have historically supported is retail rescue. And I just wanted to throw that out there because most of us belong to kennel clubs that have responsible rescue groups working with them or maybe we've done rescue ourselves. So it's important to distinguish that what we're talking about is a new variety of rescue that nobody who really cares about animal welfare should support. So uh, we've been working on this issue a really long time. It was interesting to me. Uh, a couple of things were brought up. Somebody mentioned, actually read from the compendium the rabies compendium, and it was kind of interesting to me because actually our group, little NAIA, is largely responsible for that language. We were working with Dr. Uh, Ernie Zirkel when he was president of the National Association of State and Public Health Veterinarians. We gave him the information we had. This was like 2003, 4, somewhere in there. And he was working with us very strongly. He, he recognized that this was a very, very serious issue. and. Um, was going to try to amend a particular federal law that they were working on at the time. But as things happened in the political sphere, something came up that was a, a cruncher for other things he was working on. And what they wound up doing was simply amending the rabies compendium, which we, we cite all the time now. And this is the part where he says that they, would, they recommend prohibiting uh, the importation of dogs from areas where there's rabies dog-to-dog -dog rabies for either, and this is what really changed in the rabies compendium, not just for sale, but for adoption or, or sale. So they recognized that there was something new going on. And then the other thing that we had just a very, very important role in was the 2007 or 8 uh, amendment to the uh, Farm Bill that passed that year that, that um, said that dogs under six months of age could not be imported into the United States for resale. And originally, that was a broader, it wasn't limited by age originally. It was a compromise sort of amendment. I believe that some of the activist groups got involved, and they were marketing the idea that they were going to prevent puppy mill dogs from Europe coming into their constituency. So it was sort of a compromise. We got the six months um, settlement. We got something out of it. They were a bigger voice than us in the end. Anyway, so. Um, 
Just very briefly, um, I've just told you the, re the definition of retail rescue here is the practice of moving dogs from areas of high supply to areas where demand for dogs exceeds supply, and it's both national and international. And then that we believe that retail rescue is the most serious animal welfare problem facing dogs in the United States. And there are all kinds of different aspects of it that we could talk about. We could talk about fraud. We could talk about degrading the marketplace, all those different kinds of things. But the two things, the only two things that Dr. Goldman and I are going to talk about today are the risks from zoonotic diseases and other infectious diseases and parasites that can hurt our dogs. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the saturation of the marketplace with this mass number of imports that's coming in. And then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the statutes that we would like to, to uh, get in place, work on next year. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Arnie, who's going to talk to you about what he sees in his practice. Thank you, Patty. While I find my PowerPoint, uh, I will say that it's always an honor and a privilege for me to have the opportunity to speak to peers and colleagues and friends here at NAIA. If you've heard my talk before, twice here I've spoken about you know, what was going on in Connecticut um, and how that related to other northeastern states and what my opinions were um, about all of that. And we, we've sort of changed it a little bit today, and as Patty alluded to, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about infectious disease risk. and. I guess that's fortuitous coming on the heels of Dr. K. Carter Corker and Gleason Murphy's talks. Now, Patty, why won't that open? Okay, good. So I, I come to this topic as a practicing veterinarian who happens to be an advocate. Um, yeah, I screwed that up too. Let's see. Slideshow. And I guess what strikes me. Beautiful. What, what strikes me is, is, I don't know if you use the word irony, or um, it's just how much uh, the truth uh, does not jive with what people say. And I don't mean you people. I mean, you know, all right, so I'm naive, OK? I, I get that. But so uh, there, there's a form of, of what is called cognitive dissonance in all of this. You know, anybody who's involved with uh, veterinary medicine or animals, you know, you learn a certain amount of epidemiology in veterinary school, and if you have an interest in it, you can go on and take additional coursework in it. And you know about infectious disease. You're not an expert in any one particular infectious disease, and if you don't work in government, you're not involved in regulation thereof. But you, but you know the principles. And yet, right in front of our noses are these behaviors and actions going on that completely contradict all of that. And, and, and so that's a form of cognitive dissonance. And so that became the theme for this talk of mine today. So you'll just bear with me while I figure out how to do this. There we go. So as always, we start with the veterinarian's oath, which swears veterinarians to work, use their knowledge and skills for the benefit of society. That's the first statement. And yet, a lot of times, I find among colleagues that that's the part of the oath that they sort of gloss over the most, and they go right to the relieve animal suffering and improve animal welfare. And those things are important. They're very important, because we care. Intersection of love and science and all of that. But I, but I think the societal role, and, and any veterinarian out there in a public health or regulatory role would probably agree with this, it's, it's, it's undervalued and very important, because ultimately, you know, what we do impacts human health. And that brings us to Calvin Schwabe. So veterinarians in the audience will probably know who this is. Certainly, um, he's known as the father of veterinary epidemiology. And it's reported that he was the first, uh, first veterinarian scientist to sort of bring this idea of one medicine, which we now call One Health, uh, out into uh, the public sphere. The idea that animal health, human health, and environmental health are intertwined, and that the only way to deal effectively with any of them is to consider all of them. And so we even have a One Health Day today. It was just, it was just a couple of days ago, actually. And there are a number of institutes and activities all over the world regarding that. And so this idea is, is moving, moving ahead. 
And so we talked briefly about these principles of disease pre uh, prevention. I'm not going to read them to you, but you get the general idea. Um, disease is dependent on host factors and the agent. And so these are all methods uh, by which one would help to prevent disease. And things like quarantine and isolation, all of those things are, are important elements of disease prevention. Yet at the same time, we see these mass movements of animals with dubious paperwork and oversight, no fault of the government agencies, we know, because they only have so much regulatory authority. Um, and so that's the cognitive dissonance. So m most of you may, unless you've got a degree in psychology, you may not have heard of this Leon Festinger. But Dr. Festinger came up with this cognitive dissonance theory, which basically says, that you can't hold two opposing ideas at the same time and be happy about it. It just makes one uncomfortable. And, uh, you know, without making this into a semantic conversation, you know, I see this, this idea in uh, retail rescue. I see the idea. And the reason I see the idea is because there's these two ideas that large-scale congregation and movement of immunologically vulnerable and or overtly ill animals is likely to lead to disease exposure, expression, and transmission, both among them and between them, and our local animals and or people. This is risky. Then you have this other thought. Unclaimed dogs in distant states, territories, and foreign nations lead inhumane and sad lives, and taking action to bring them under our control improves those individual dogs' lives. This makes me feel good. And I see those two ideas as very hard to reconcile, uh, certainly not in a way that is satisfactory for everybody. So through our understanding of epidemiology, the science of disease transmission, we have created and attempted to enforce laws, regulations, procedures, and behaviors to limit disease transmission and its consequences. Through our emotionally based disregard of facts and risks, we mindlessly thwart all of that. And when I say we, I mean anyone else who's not in this room. <laughs> so as I said, I, I come to this topic really just as a practicing veterinarian and an advocate. It started, I don't know, eight, nine years ago when clients started saying occasionally, oh, she's a rescue, until just about everybody tells me that. And I don't know what reaction they're quite expecting. Uh, do I need to pin a medal on them? I, I, I don't know. But now, as, as we all know, there are many, many rescued animals in the conventional sense. And, um, and as, as time went on back then, I, I started discussing it with my colleagues on the Connecticut Veterinary Medical Association board, and they too noticed health problems with these rescued animals, whether it was Demodex or heartworm, just a variety of things, deformities and things that weren't reported. Uh, in the photographs and descriptions on petfinder.com. And so for those of you who have been here before, you'll remember that in 2010, my hospital manager and I did a little investigation. And there's only two slides of that. This was one of them. This was one of these commuter lots where Peterson Express Transport showed up, and it's got the map of his, his route at that time. And then the other thing we looked at were these adoption events at certain uh, types of pet re retailers and we, we went in there and posed as a family trying to get a dog and learned about that. And I learned that the dogs were not treated humanely and they certainly weren't following regulations and a lot of cash was changing hands. And uh, I, I, I left this slide in because you can imagine, I mean, this, this aircraft is very expensive and to run it, it's $3,275 an hour. Um, and yet, it's being used to move dogs around. And I actually know someone who's involved in this, and maybe it's a loss leader or a tax write-off for them, but these jets fly into some of those airports where the import, what was it, port of entry is unstaffed. And, and the reason I know that is because the client in question tells me that. And you'll notice I, I've intentionally obscured the tail number on this aircraft. So in contrast, 
you know, we're really good about regulating importation and movement of food animals. There's all sorts of, this, these documents are from the Center for Food Security and Public Health at Iowa State. I put them on there just to illustrate the point that the wise farmer doesn't bring new animals in without making sure that they come from a disease-free source, that perhaps they're isolated for a time, that trucks and per people coming on the farm um, have to wash their boots or the underside of the truck goes through a car wash. So I, I was amazed to see how many large farms have full-size vehicle washes uh, on their driveways in various locations. But so there's a, the point is that there's a great deal of risk management in that because the economics dictated and because it's necessary. And if you are a veterinarian working in food animal practice and you see signs that are consistent with a foreign animal disease, there's a process for that where you call your area veterinarian in charge for USDA and suddenly you have all the help you need because especially if it's a vesicular disease, they'll come right out and it's considered an emergency because it's a big deal economically for animal health. Uh, same thing with horses. There's a lot of controls over horses uh, and, and methodologies and practices that one has to follow to move them interstate or into the country. Uh, and as uh, Dr. Murphy mentioned, there's more and more publications now that uh, are appearing that's saying, hmm, maybe mass movement of dogs is, uh, should be treated like mass movement of food animals, that maybe it's not so risk-free. Uh, a statement out of this article is it's important to acknowledge that many of the pathogens important in canine group settings also cause disease in people. Now, while this article is about, you know, fanciers' activities, sporting events and agility and those sorts of things, you know, rescue transport, retail rescue, is also a congregate activity, and the animals may well be ill and stressed. Uh, for individual dogs, these are, are uh, CDC documents that people recognize, but there are, you know, f uh, sort of uh, citizen-friendly advice documents for moving your personal individual dog in and out of Canada and in and out of Mexico. You know, that's, that's nicely arranged, and as far as we know, it works pretty well. The ABMA, seeing uh, this whole thing transpire over the last decade or so, has, through their Animal Welfare Committee, uh, produced this document called Relocation of Dogs and Cats for Adoption. And it talks quite a bit about the risks and benefits. Now, before anybody criticizes, do understand that AVMA, and, and I, I'm not representing them today, but I do represent them sometimes, you know, they're an umbrella organization, and their membership is now in the 90,000 veterinarian range, and they're all over the map. You know, it's just like the population of the whole country politically. Some believe in extreme animal rights positions. Others are completely opposed to that and everybody in between. So the best AVMA can do is to provide fact-based information that addresses animal health and welfare, uh, infectious disease control. Nobody can argue with any of that. Uh, it's, it's, they've got to stay out of that or the membership isn't there and then they lose all their battles. But I think this is actually a good document and I, I pulled two quotes out. Uh, in this one, animal transport programs have the potential to spread infectious disease along animal transport corridors and to new destinations. The stress of transport may increase susceptibility to infection or increase viral shedding. The risk of exposure to infectious disease is increased when animals from multiple sources are transported together. So those are the kinds of thoughts and ideas that make up biosecurity and all the things you learn in epidemiology and infectious disease classes. And these are the kinds of things that Dr. Schwabe taught uh, when he was still with us. So that acknowledges that. And then finally, while responsible relocation of dogs and cats for adoption can facilitate placement of these individual animals into good homes, relocation should not be viewed as a substitute for appropriate and effective animal control policies enacted and enforced by local governments. And that's kind of been my gripe uh, all along, and that's sort of how I got passionate about this issue, that, you know, why are states shifting this problem around? If Connecticut has solved its problem, uh, why, why doesn't some other unnamed state of the 50 solve its problem? Why am I enabling your lack of 
desire to solve your problem. And that's, that's been a gripe of mine from the beginning, and if you've heard me speak, I've said so before. Anyway, so that, I think that's a good document from AVMA. They're not passing judgment because they can't. So we've talked a little bit about rabies today, and Dr. Murphy, you correct me if you see an error here. The reason I pull these eight countries out of the several hundred, 300 and some odd that there are, is because I had a news article saved from uh, the NAIA listserv. Those of you who are on the listserv, you get frequent articles uh, of interest. And these were all articles that touched on rabies transmission or other disease transmission from these countries at one point or another in the last year or two. Um, here's another AVMA article that I think was put up earlier. The importation of dogs into the United States poses a risk for the introduction of rabies and other zoonotic disease. Really? And from that article, at the bottom, there's an arrow, 287,000 dogs that we know about are estimated to have been imported in the United States during 2006, including 70,600 unvaccinated dogs that we know about. So, yeah, I mean, it's a Wild West show out there. And I think, I'm not one to ask for more government. But in this case, I want more. So I pulled this out of another article. It just shows you uh, the geography of canine variant rabies. I mean, those are a lot of countries. And we get dogs moved from some of them, indirectly or directly. Uh, here's one, uh, an article that came from the NAI listserv talking about homeless stray cats and dogs from China being flown to Seattle despite recent rabies outbreak in Taiwan. I mean, really, have you ever been to a, a shelter that has cats and not seen like 300 adult cats that needed homes? Why are we importing cats? Uh, you know, that, that's just a separate issue entirely. And then with the dogs, I mean, is this wise? I don't think so. Iraq, now I assume this particular dog came home with a soldier or a contractor who was there into New Jersey. Um, I don't know the details, but suffice it to say, we should be much more careful about this sort of thing. There are dogs coming in from our territories and rabies is there. Why are we doing that? Why aren't we having each place solve its problem on its own ground? Makes no sense to me. And in Vermont, uh, this is the case where 15 people had to get rabies post-exposure prophylaxis because of a dog that tested positive from rabies. And that dog came from via New York and Connecticut and the, the original origin, who knows? It's not mentioned there. And there's other zoonotic diseases, diseases that affect people and animals that are spread over the world. And there's some new ones coming out all the time, you know, in the last few years, right? Zika, SARS, those kinds of things, different influenzas. Not that dogs get all of those, but just the idea that we're so loose in the way we allow these animals to come in, uh, eventually we're gonna have a disaster, I think, if, if it continues as it has. So in this slide, it's just a map of, or a chart of, um, hotspots for various zoonotic diseases that are known, some of which dogs can carry, um, and dogs continue to arrive. Is it fair to the dogs who are already here? Is it fair to our country to allow that unfettered importation? Uh, some of the diseases that we can talk about that dogs may carry, babesiosis, brucellosis, a disease that may be near and not so dear to the dog breeders in this audience, um, are we testing the dogs coming in for brucellosis? Should we be, if they're intact? Leishmaniasis, a disease that comes from a sand fly. Uh, dogs can carry that. Trypanosoma cruzi, it's from kissing bugs. Dogs can carry it. And then in the news recently, you probably all heard about this if you're from Florida or just read about it, screwworms are a, a fly larvae that is um, a, one, one of the unique 
ones that will eat its way into living tissue as opposed to many other forms of flies and maggots. And there was an unexpected outbreak in these key deer down in the Florida Keys. And it's a very bad disease with high economic consequence. Our country invested untold millions in the 50s and 60s to develop a program to push it back out of our country through Mexico and below the Panama Canal, where, as far as I know, it was until pretty recently. And so we've lost, I don't know how many, 125 deer or so, something like that. Yeah, is it a smaller number have died? Oh, okay. Right, it's just a pretty, you know, the, the potential economic consequences of it. In, a, in animal welfare costs as well as money costs are, are grave, you know. Um, this is what it looks like. You know, if you're familiar with it, I mean, like any other maggot, but it's a particularly nasty one. And I think a dog, one dog was put down, to my understanding, because of it, because you can't be sure you got rid of it all. And, and sometimes the, the wounds are so bad. So this is a foreign animal disease. It's a parasite, you could say. And if we're importing dogs from who knows where, from some of the countries on that, on that map that we looked at before, I mean, is it worth taking the risk of bringing something like this direct into one of the heartland airports? Maybe in the warmer months when it can get a foothold? Not to me. Right. Right. I, I fly a small plane and I go into a lot of airports and there's nobody there at night. You know, so. so here's a case much closer to home and I can talk about with authority. Uh, those of you who are with USDA may have seen this case report. Within uh, USDA there's a publication called VMO Observer um, which brings out interesting cases or methods uh, for the people internally. And the only reason I have it is because I was one of the participants in, in producing this case report. And the story goes that a young diplomat went to Ghana with his dog and then brought his dog back. And for whatever reason, somebody didn't catch the bumps on the dog's leg coming through the port of entry, if there was an official look at all. And that's what it looked like in my office. Do you see around the knee, the stifle, you can see those bumps. And when I shaved the fur, you know, that's what we found. Now, there were no openings that I could see, so I let it go 24 hours, and the next day, there were openings in all those fur uncles, I guess I'd call them, and out of them came those. Now, these are not screw worms. This was a, another fly larvae called the Lunds fly. And it's closely related to a fly called the tumbu fly that has been seen in this country for, in dogs imported from out Africa and Asia. But it just so happened that this one was different and it had never been seen before in the US. So I thought that was kind of cool because I haven't diagnosed anything for the first time ever uh, before. So anyway, so this, but someone could, this dog was just you know on the beach in Africa with his owner and the dog was allowed in, and either the lesions weren't noticed or they weren't looked at at all. And so that's how easily it is to, and this was just one dog, and this was an owned dog, one that, you know, somebody cared about. So th this is sort of towards the end of my comments. There's a conflation, and I think we heard it earlier a little bit, they, when the public hears news about dogs with disease that have moved around the country, they don't really distinguish between whether the dogs were intentionally bred for import or they've just come in with a rescue group. And I was pleased to see uh, Dr. Carter Corker talk about each of those topics separately. Um, and, and I hope that somehow that information will get out, get out there. Um, because smuggling puppies is one thing and then importing all these dogs from congregate settings is something else again. Neither are right, but there are different problems. And then, of course, the, the travel documents. I mean, the colleagues, if there are American veterinarians falsifying documents and not doing their duty, 
there ought to be serious consequences for that because the consequences to the country could be grave and certainly to individual people and animal owners and the animals themselves. We've got our own animal problems around the country. This lady uh, was torn up and killed by dogs in Dallas. Unknown to me until a few months ago, there's 9,000 stray dogs in South Dallas and they roam around in packs and um, the, the city commissioned a study uh, a high dollar study to try to figure out how to get rid of them. Uh, and of course you've got, you can imagine, people focused on animal welfare instead of human welfare are pushing back against some of the suggested methods in the study. Don't know where that's gonna go, but if you hadn't heard about this, it, I thought it was pretty interesting and certainly sad for that woman. So I think it's time to resolve our cognitive dissonance. You know, yeah, there's animals suffering all around, and I care about that, but we can't solve them all here. And we should stop importing animals in large numbers in, in the retail rescue fashion until and unless you know, we're 98% solved in our own problems here, and we're far from that. I mean, I don't believe in the concept. <laughs> I, I, didn't, I never get an applause at home, uh, but I, I, you know, I, I don't believe in, uh, well, I lost my train of thought, but thank you for the applause. <laughs> so, uh, moving on. <laughs> no, the one picture didn't play, but uh, so that's all I have. And for those of you who were kind enough to remember that last year my daughter was engaged and about to get married, I put three pictures of the wedding up. <laughs> thank you very much. Oh, yeah. Uh, if there's any questions, I'll take them, or else it's Patty's turn. Okay. Easy. I have a question at the end. Okay. Uh, escape. Very good. Patty? <laughs> okay. Let's see. Got to find mine again. Okay. I never can find them. Okay. Got too many on here. Nope, I'm trying to find mine. They all start off NAIA 2016. Well, mine is there. Yours might be on the bottom Maybe. because it would be there. No, nope, that's this morning's. There's about 20 on here now. Sorry about that. You want me to go sit down? Uh, just, no, no, stay here. I hope this is it. No. Nope. This is it, I think. There we are. We're back. I'm sorry about that. It took me a bit. So um, Arnie has just talked to you. Dr. Goldman has just talked to you about zoonotic diseases, infectious diseases, and how they threaten our dogs. All of us, I think, the breeders in this room are uh, worried about the threats uh, that come their way. The other really big threat that threatens the very existence of purebred dogs is... Yeah, okay, yeah, no, I'm, I'm fine, I'm fine. Okay, yeah, um, is just the saturation of the marketplace from the dogs that are imported in. And it's absolutely huge. I think one of the other reasons why we have not had a response from a lot of the government agencies that might have helped us, and I totally exclude USDA and CDC, I think that you guys have done as much as you can with the authority that you have to, to work on these issues. But I think the number, the sheer number of dogs that are being moved around the country is not known, even by, even by the people who recognize that there's a problem. I don't think that they recognize the scope of it, that we know we're dealing with well over at least a million dogs being moved in this underground channel within the United States, and that we have hundreds and hundreds of thousands pouring in across the border too. I think that maybe everybody kind of looks at it regionally and they assess the problem and they think it's bad, but I just think, I think the lack of grasp of the scope of it um, has something to do with why we haven't had the kind of uh, attention that we need. 
So retail rescue saturates the dog, dog marketplace displacing other sources of dogs. And it's not just dogs that are deliberately bred, dogs that are produced by hobby dog breeders or sold in pet stores, but also shelter dogs in the local area. The importation of dogs into any uh, other part of the country is going to just simply displace the dogs that are there. And I just have a few slides for you from the shelter project. We keep track of uh, dogs. As I mentioned this morning, we probably have the best data at this point. I I'm sure we do. The best public uh, open data anyway on this issue of uh, any group in the United States. And we collect it by individual community. If the state has a law on the books that says that uh, the different shelters and rescues have to report, we might have it on a statewide basis. But basically, when we started working on this eight or nine years ago, there were very few states that had statewide data. Date. Right now, I think we have about 12 states that have some set of data that you can collect that is reliable. Not all of them have. Uh, the level of detail that we like to see, but at least there is some in about 12 states that are willing to share it openly. So this is my local humane society, and I just want to show you that they, um, you can see that there's a strong downward trend for a long, long time, and then it levels off. And what you know when you see that particular trend is that the decline in the, the elimination of dog overpopulation got to a certain point, and then the shelter began to bring dogs in. Um, I, can take, I can show you 100 graphs that look just like this, and I can prove in every case probably, well, maybe not in every case, but in most cases, we can tie it directly to dogs that we know are being shipped in. OK, um, this is the number of dogs euthanized. Obviously, there's no problem. I will tell you that in my city in 1974, the two major shelters, Multnomah County and Oregon Humane Society, together were putting to sleep 18,000 dogs. I mean, it really was a, a horrible situation at that time. Multnomah County put to sleep 168 dogs last year by themselves, down from around 7,000. So, I mean, we are talking about a problem that has you know, been solved, and largely by the people who are responsible pet owners and people who are responsible breeders. And so that's why it's especially frustrating, I think, to this group, is as Dr. Goldman has said, um, you know, one of his gripes is that, gosh, you know, your tax dollars went to put in programs for offering free and uh, low-cost spay and neuter, and you put in responsible dog ownership laws years and years ago, and now basically you're become, you've become a pipeline destination spot for states that didn't do any of that stuff, and, and actually for foreign countries too. Okay, so I just wanted to show you that this is the natural trend line um, in most parts of the country. There are a few states, I'd say Texas and Oklahoma, Alabama, Mississippi, Arkansas, uh, a lot of states down in that area that are agricultural didn't didn't start with the, the same regulations, the same local regulations at the time that the, a lot of the cities in the north did. Um, the, this is a graph here that shows you the number of dogs that this local shelter imported last year. And the reason we know this is that in order to qualify for a grant, they have to publish this kind of information. And so this is from forms that they have published themselves, 3,501 dogs. Um, and this is what their adoption graph looks like. So they're in business. It's very, very clear that without the importation of these dogs, they would not be able to operate as they have in the past. And they now have a new mission all over the city of Portland. We see end petlessness. So they're kind of acknowledging quietly that they're shifting what they've done historically. I don't think that they put a banner out to tell the public exactly how, how they're getting their dogs or any of that. Um, Colorado, I'll give you another example that's a um, little bigger example. Colorado, by the way, has the best data of any of the states. I'm proud to have worked with the Colorado Federation back in 1992 and get the law passed for the Pet Animal Care and Facilities Act there. And over, over time, they have evolved and they have begun collecting data. And now they not only collect um, data that shows the number of animals taken in, the number of animals euthanized, returned to owners and adopted out, but also what the source of those animals was, whether it was in-state or out-of-state. And last year, they also added a, a new metric, which is to um, show you how many dogs were less than 120 days old, because the nature of the importation, the type of dogs that are coming in has also changed. And uh, two years ago, 
it was like 50.1 or two, just barely over 50% of all the dogs they took in were less than 120 days old, not your typical rescue. So again, when we talk about retail rescue and we uh, talk about it negatively, we're talking about something different than the kind of historic rescue that most of us in our kennel clubs did where we did it out of our own pocket or our clubs donated money so we could have the dogs spayed and neutered and nobody expected profit. These are absolutely um, profit centers for these for these groups. So okay, they um, they were this this graph starts in 2000 and it's going up. You know, it's going going up. Um, this is their their euthanasia figures of overall decline, but there's a little pop up there in the last couple of years. This is how many dogs they took in according to their records in 2015, 28,000, and these are the dogs that where an entity of shelter or a rescue has allowed itself to become licensed by the state and reported their data. And if you talk to the officials in the state, they will tell you that they believe that this is a fraction of the number actually coming in. And I can tell you from looking at the health certificates that we work with several other people who are working on this issue as well. And we have um, been fortunate enough to see somewhere well over 400,000 certificates of veterinary inspection, which have anywhere from one to 15 dogs on them. In other words, we know that we're dealing with well over a million dogs in this particular channel. These are dogs that are going through rescue and going to specific shelters or other rescue groups. A small number, um, uh-oh, looks like my time ran out on my <laughs> subscription here. <laughs> Dave. <laughs> Oh, I guess I don't. I guess I don't. Well, I'm going to close that sucker. <laughs> okay. Just have to find out where I was going. You know, Patty, uh, so, sorry, 28,000 dogs into Colorado in 2015. Yes. You said six or seven Connecticut into Colorado. Oh, yeah. We took in 20,000 we know about into Connecticut. Yeah. So it's got to be. Oh, yeah. This, this, is a, this is a fraction of what's really going on. And then I also, let's see, I also grabbed this for you. This is the number of dogs, um, the increase in the number of dogs they are placing through the rescues and shelter groups in the state of Colorado. And look how close that number is to the number they're importing. So there really isn't much question about what's going on. Okay, so that has a negative effect on the dogs that are bred locally or that were traditionally in that marketplace. I can say quite certainly from the data that we have that most of the, well, all of the Pacific Northwest up into Idaho, Montana, and mostly around the Great Lakes now, um, definitely up in the Northeast Corridor, there are not enough dogs to meet demand without this particular kind of operation going on at this point. Because coupled with this, um, many of the same groups that participate in this particular variety of rescue also legislate against dog breeders and breeding and against um, any kind of retail outlet that would place do sell dogs as well. So it's a double whammy and um, this is how it's increased over the years. 2012, Colorado was bringing in 12,642. Next year, 24,278. Next year, this last year was 28,020. And I asked while I was still working with AKC, um, one of the people there, if they could get me um, to just, I was just kind of interested if we could look at our internal data and see whether this had any kind of effect on us or guess whether it does. Uh, can't really prove, prove a cause and effect for sure, but um, we tracked this for a period of about six years. And during those years, the number of dog, the increase in the number of dogs going into the state was 51% and the number of purebred dogs that had declined in registrations in the state was 47. So I think there's an effect. I don't think there's much, much question about that either. Um, and of course, AKC registrations drop, has dropped very, very significantly. They're starting to come back up thanks to some good management decisions and promotions of purebred dogs that are going on now. But this steep decline, it's all, there's also no question that it is a result of the combination of bad legislation and the underground movement of these dogs for, uh, for sale in the marketplace under the, under the banner of rescue. Okay, so what's next? And this, this is, um, 
one of the things that's become very clear to me, I'm a little bit dense, we've been working on this issue. I think we did the first article on it in 2003, and here we are, it's like, you know, a lot of years later, right? 12 years later, we, we are just now, just thankfully, um, hearing Kay this morning, that was really good to hear some of the things that you're going to be doing, especially when you talked about the fact that you're gonna be regulating entities by their activities rather than what they call themselves. That's something that absolutely needs to happen. Um, but we still have some concerns uh, about, that we, we think need to be addressed in, by new laws, because the fact is the agencies, no matter how good their staff is, no matter what, uh, how much they might want to help on some of these issues, they just do not have the statutory authority to, to do some of these things. So, um, at the state level, uh, some of you here in Florida worked with us on passing a statewide bill here that would require shelters to report their information. Um, and I think we did that about five years ago. Is that right, Judith? Uh, well, Su Susan, it's, it's been a while now. Um, 2013, okay, all right, yeah. And we got kind of, a, um, the one that we passed here is not nearly as strong as Colorado's, but Colorado's, it took many years for it to get to the point that it is now. Anyway, we wanna to continue to pass these bills in every state, just so that people get, can get a handle on this part of the marketplace, what's going on. Um, so that's one thing that we want to do at the state level. The other thing is um, I, I, we wanted to do exactly what Kay said they're going to do through the USDA, which is pass laws that recognize, in your case, regulations that recognize rescue as part of commerce and therefore regulate them accordingly. So we're very happy to hear that um, you're going to be doing that. At the federal level, one of the things that strikes us as very important that's missing is there is no central database for all this information. I mentioned earlier that through working with others that have done countless freedom of information requests and through the work of Barbara collecting stuff for the shelter project, altogether we can assess very, very clearly that we're talking about moving at least a million dogs a year in this underground, uh, at least. I mean, I, I think that that's maybe a fraction, It's, uh, but, but I can just tell you that for sure, okay? Yeah, it's biblical, he says, so I think he's right. Anyway, so the fact is that um, right now, health certificates are issued by the, um, the veterinarians, and those health certificates uh, are part, they stay in the state. The federal government doesn't get to look at these, and so if they want to take a big look at what's happening nationwide, they have to pretty much do what we do and do freedom of information requests. And we believe that we should um, help facilitate the creation of a central database for all this information, get a law passed that, that uh, requires this, and the funding for it, because that's always a really big part of any animal law you pass. Uh, a lot of times with lawmakers, the, the zeal for passing the law is, um, once the law is done, they're done with it, and they don't ever fund it, and so we don't really get the solutions that we need. So um, we would like to see a central database so that every time a vet a health certificate is issued, a duplicate copy is sent to a federal central database. We just think that's essential. And then um, we would like to see a federal law passed that prohibits the importation of random source dogs for resale or transfer. One of the big problems that we have is that um, because these dogs are not viewed as in commerce or trade, they're not going to a veteran, like a state veterinarian like you'd have with the food animals. Um, they're getting to go to just any local veterinarian and have them sign off on them. And the dog that came in from Egypt that had rabies, those papers were falsified. And there have been a lot of other cases of dogs coming in with various, uh, under bad conditions where we have found later that the papers were falsified. So we think that, first of all, we, we don't think random source dogs, in other words, street dogs, whether it's from, I don't care what the sad story is, by the way, either. Um, the meat dogs from Korea, I just don't think that it's appropriate for the United States to be importing dogs um, that have no previous owner, therefore have no veterinary history into our country until we have the, all the problems solved and we can have an open, honest, public discussion about what we're doing. And, uh, yeah. So. Okay, and uh, let's see. Yeah, and then to augment 
um, the statement that is in the National Association of State and Public Health Vets compendium, which is that no dogs uh, should be imported into the United States um, from anywhere where there's dog-to-dog -dog rabies for adoption or, or resale. And I would add for highly infectious diseases because the dogs that came in, the meat dogs that came in from Korea, according to Cornell that did the, the study uh, on the particular strain, said it was a South Korean strain. I don't know if they can trace it to the meat dogs, but certainly that was the implication in the articles that I have read. I don't want my dogs to get sick. I don't want dogs, period, to wind up having to go to a vet and spend two or three thousand um, dollars because of our carelessness. So, so I would just add, I mean, of course the rabies compendium is all about just rabies, I understand that, but I think in a, a law that we work on together uh, federally that we should, first of all, no dogs, no random source dogs come in, because at that point they're going to have to admit they're in commerce, and once they're in commerce they will have to go through a completely different process. Okay, so anyway, um, I am, we're kind of over our time, and so I'm going to end it right here, but um, our legislative director is here, Sarah Chisnell is back there, and if you would like to work with her, us on this, um, all organizations welcome and everything, and this is her email address, just uh, please contact her, let her know that you'd like to work with us on, on developing these laws. We do, we have been working a little bit, we've flown back to Washington a couple times this year, and I believe that there is an interest in solving this problem and passing some new laws. So thank you very much. That's it for me. Are there any questions? Is that it? One quick one. Retail oh. rescue is what to dog people? Okay. Um, Historically, uh, rescue has been a positive word. When our dogs got in trouble and they wound up in a shelter, people who loved that breed would go to the shelter, they'd take them out, they I would treat them. I know what old rescue is. Okay. Retail And rescue. retail rescue is the mass movement of dogs from areas of high supply to low supply. And it's commercial in its scope. That it's does it. And it's both national and international. And international. Yeah. And because of the fact that it is currently being regulated by what it calls itself rather than by what it's actually doing. Uh, it hasn't been regulated at all. And so it's a double-edged sword for us because, um, again, a lot of the same folks that are engaging in the retail rescue are also pushing laws to ban breeding and to ban the sale of purpose-bred dogs. We, we have the same, we've used the same terminology in the bird world for years. Oh, retail no. rescue. I'll be darned. But somebody told me that when dog breeders or dog people use it, it's for international, not an also from state to state. Yeah, it's both. But it's both. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Excuse me. Um, I just wanted to let you know really quickly, I just found this yesterday. Um, Florida Senate Bill 1108 which was enacted July 1st, 2016, for the very first time in the state of Florida. This act may be cited as the Companion Animal Protection Act, and it controls the way shelters and rescues treat animals. Oh, interesting. Which I thought was kind of, a, kind of a good win for those abusers selling their pets at, you know, PetSmart. Very good, very good, thank you. Dr. Goldman just put up this slide to remind you this is what retail rescue looks like. It's all happening in the parking lot here. <laughs> and, and I would like to share that one of the unintended consequences of exposing this activity in Florida has been that those couriers who had been stopping at agricultural way stations and having the veterinary certificates checked where we found that the animals were under age or under vaccinated are now using Florida's highways and byways and taking the long route and so uh, they may very well be like those airports where there's nobody there at night and there may be no veterinary Mm -hmm. inspections or certificates available. 
Yeah, as uh, Dr. Goldman says, it's going on anyway. And, you know, we have been really concerned because, you know, we read newspaper articles and the pilots are, that do this are bragging about what they're doing. I mean, you see articles about it all the time. And yet we have been having a very hard time finding health certificates. We're wondering, okay, what agency are these being filed with? And I think the answer is they're not being issued in the first place in maybe most cases. And I think another thing that we have to, to, to look at is since it is considered by many who who get these rescued dogs as a higher calling, uh, they're proud to say, "Oh, this is this is a rescue dog," especially if they rescued it from overseas. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know that there's much that we can do about them, but I would like to suggest to Dr. K. Carter Corn that not only do we need to identify groups based on their activity rather than what they call themselves. In other words, those, those rescues uh, who uh, feel as though they are not conducting commerce. Um, while we're letting them know that we're on to them, that the emperor has no clothes, so to speak, I think it's extremely important that the that, the, uh, that all of us, and including the CDC and, and, and APHIS, uh, let the legislature know, because left to their own devices, I'm not sure how many of the rescues would actually you know, do, do anything about it. Well, because of the good work that your federation has done, Because of the work that your federation has done and some of the stuff that we've done with you, we are beginning to work with your state vet here in Florida. You're, you have several veterinarians at the Department of Ag, and they're very interested in this, and I believe that um, they're going to be working with us in the near future. Yeah. So, Michelle? Uh, several years ago, uh, I personally took in a rescue. I had co-founded a, a rescue for my chosen breed. And um, because I have breeding animals at home and show dogs, I routinely tested them for brucellosis. This one came back positive. It was an owner turn-in dog. Um, I initiated contact with USDA for guidance and reporting um, ability. Um, we did end up deciding to euthanize the dog. Um, and then I also contacted the former owner who was undergoing chemotherapy uh -huh. and uh, contacted her veterinarian as well, provided all the data, full disclosure, and therefore she got all of her other animals tested, including herself. Luckily, everyone else was negative. Mm -hmm. But brucellosis is just an absolutely yeah. huge threat to and this too community. too many people are ignoring it. Yeah. The uh, Illinois Animal Welfare Association conference I attended a few years ago, later after that, most of the shelter people there had no idea what brucellosis was. They only thought it could be contracted by breeding dogs. Mm -hmm. um, and at least I had the veterinarians there to back up. Well, but we all need to be very aware of that. It can happen. It does not have to come from a shelter dog or a commercial. Pro probably the biggest whatever. source of brucellosis today, I mean, we're just finding this out from the source documents we have, are from reservations because a lot of the sources where uh, the rescue groups were getting their dogs before are depleted or somewhat depleted, and there's a huge number of dogs available on the reservations and there's street dogs. And brucellosis is just, you have a higher incidence in street dogs, whether they're on a reservation or on the streets of a foreign country. So, and I also uh, reminded people that the commercial breeders are required to test for brucellosis. And so the, it's coming from the poor the poor or ignorant people that won't do it. Yeah. But we now test all dog come from before they go to yeah. our good, good advice, Michelle. So very quickly, because I know we're late, uh, one of the unintended consequences of requiring you know, the health certificates from the rescues and the transportations of dogs from state to state, because that's how it goes, it has to do right now with a lot of the professional handlers. They're being stopped because they have a box truck or they have, you know, a cargo van, and they're being stopped because they're thinking, you know, like they're rescues and stuff, and being required to have 
a health certificate, which it has to be 30 days. That's another thing we need to look into. A lot of the handlers, what they're doing now, they're badging, buying passenger vans mm -hmm. to transport the dogs so they have less chances of being you know, stopped mm -hmm. by, um, you know. It was interesting to me that the AVMA document talked about dogs being moved for agility and things like that when you have a million dogs being moved for resale. So it is interesting and it really shows you who owns the conversation. And right now it's not us. Yeah, but that's, so. that's one thing, yeah, that we got to look into it as well. Thank you, Dallas.